In today's show, it's another ADP battle, this time with Dan Titus of Yahoo. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by BetOnline. BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, lot, odds and lines than ever before. BetOnline is where the game starts. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. And we are available on all platforms. We're here to do an ADP battle. Dan Titus from Yahoo Sports. We're going to look at five made-up draft pick numbers and just talk about two players, who we would take in that scenario, pros and cons, and all that sort of stuff. You know how this works by now. So, warning. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're going to bring him in. It's the first time he's been on the show. He is now the uh, fantasy basketball analyst at Yahoo Sports. Dan Titus, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Josh. It's been a long time coming, man. We've been exchanging DMs for a while, yes. and um, yeah, this is a uh, this is the this is the the pinnacle of uh, success right now. Talking to Josh Lloyd, the the man of basketball monster and many things, but uh, we're here to talk about some ADP battles, man. So I'm ready to I'm ready to fight it out right now. We are talking ADP battles, and if people don't know what the concept is, I'm just picking an imaginary draft number, sort of around where we've got guys ranked and ADPs, and saying, well. If, this, we're sitting at this pick, and these two players were available. What are we going to do at that particular spot? Let's start with some big men. Let's start in the early rounds, and let's start at pick number 30. Miles Turner's on the board. Rudy Gobert is on the board. What are you doing? Categories League, I'm leaning towards Miles Turner here, mainly because I get the, the injury risk. But aside from that, this man's on the trade block. Um, it seems like every day, every year, he just keep, names keeps keep on popping up. But I really love his efficiency and what he brings to you um, from the center position. He has the ability to stretch the floor as a as a, a big shooter, a bigger shooting big. But we already know what he does defensively. He's going to be among the league leaders in blocks. And I, I tend to tr- to select him over Rudy Gobert mainly because I think there's going to be a log jam a little bit. I know Carl Anthony Towns has lost a lot of weight. He's coming over a sickness, but once he's back into that lineup. What does that Minnesota Timberwolves front court look like? And this is the most competition he's had for touches in the paint. And I think that there could be some cannibalization there where you'll see Carl Anthony Towns' rebounds go slightly down. But I also think that that also hurts Rudy Gobert a little bit. And that's really Gobert's value. It's his, it's his rebounds and his blocks and his field goal percentage. And if those suffer by just a lack of touches, similar to what he had in Utah, I think that could depress his value a little bit. So I'd prefer to get Miles Turner here, um, who has less competition right now for, for touches. In, an, in the offense of the Indiana Pacers. Obviously, the basis of this show is going to tell you that I disagree with you, because I do, but um, <laughs> I don't disagree with everything, because I've been harping on about, hey, I think Towns is going to lose quite a bit this season, but that doesn't mean that Gobert loses nothing. Like, he does lose probably a rebound or so. He probably does lose a shot or so. And you say, like, you know, no one drafts Gobert for his scoring, but as you mentioned, if he doesn't, if he takes one fewer shot per game or two fewer shots per game, the overall impact that he provides in field goal percentage drops because that's all volume based. Like if you're shooting 70% on 25 shots or 72% on 10 shots, you take the 70% guy on 25 shots. Now he's never getting 25 shots, but that lack of volume or impact, if that does drop, then he turns into one of those guys that you know, shoot, shoots like Dan Gafford and might shoot 71% and take four shots a game. I'm not saying that Gobert right. is going to do that. Now my issue with Turner is... Um, the injuries, I'm, I'm not that worried about. I think some of those were a little bit exaggerated. I know he had, not exaggerated, but the it made more sense to extend his recovery time on that Pacers team last season. And I actually don't, I'm not that worried if he does get traded to the Lakers because I think he'll still sort of be the same. Um, I guess my issue is, I, I'm just not, I've never seen him play 33 or 34 minutes and I don't know whether he actually can. If, if he could, then there is value that, but his value is concentrated, Dan, in really one category. Like, he's not a big field goal percentage guy. He's not a big rebounder. He takes some threes and should take more, but it's blocks, right? Like, that's it. He might block three and a half shots per game. And as I talk about in this show, like, if he goes from 3.5, an unbelievable number, to 
an also unbelievable number, but it's a huge difference in his overall value that he goes from elite to still elite, but not the same level of elite. That that if that number varies, and we've seen it vary for him over the over the course of the. Yeah, his career, he's had like, I think a 3.7 block season and then the next year followed up with 2.5. And this, and it's still, I think they'll both lead in the league. But it's a massive difference to overall fantasy value. And I feel there's just a little bit more uncertainty with Miles Turner. Uh, now I ta- I'm taking Turner in a lot of third rounds in drafts. I would just, if I probably had the choice, in most cases I would take Gobert over him. I guess the only other thing I'd say is that obviously Gobert's free throws are bad. And if you don't want to hurt your free throws, then Turner can be an option. But that... that that is interesting because they are quite similar players in terms of centers and and shot blockers, but they have different strengths and different weaknesses. I'm re- and these guys okay. finished really close together last year too. What mm. twenty two and twenty four respectively in in head to head category format. So despite his Rudy Gobert's uh, deficiencies in his field in his free throw percentage, he's still really valuable fantasy player. So this is one of those that that often comes up in that third round, but I tend to take the the shooting bigs over the traditional bigs in fantasy. I honestly, like, I'm I'm all on in Rudy as a late second round guy. I'd take both of these guys. Like, I'd do Gobert and then Turner, and then my blocks are good. Like, I'm set. I've got right. my blocks. And all you other guys who are waiting for Rob Williams and Jaron Jackson to return, well, you're not going to be able to compete with me for most of the season. So I don't mind that. Now, this one is one I'm really interested in from you. We're at pick number 80. Harrison Barnes is, is there. He's there in every draft, basically. And he's probably going to go yeah. later than this. And we know that you could probably wait on him. And Ben Simmons is there. And he's available with this ADP in most spots as well. So, Dan, what are you doing here? This one's difficult. And I think it really depends on the roster build. That's but true. I've been I've been going more Ben Simmons than Harrison Barnes. And I can't lie. It scares the hell out of me. Um, mainly because, like, I think we saw in the in the preseason game what Ben Simmons can do. He's not going to be a scorer. He doesn't need to be a scorer. He should not be a scorer for this Nets team, but he's really going to stuff the stat sheet. Um, he's going to provide those defensive numbers that you look for in any kind of mid-round pick, and I think he provides upside in terms of giving you assists and rebounds as well. So he's going to be pushing the tempo in transition. He's going to have the ball in his hands and be a, a playmaker, much like a Draymond Green um, from a fantasy perspective. Don't expect him to score very much, but I think he could still provide at least – 13, 14 points per game, along with, you know, potentially eight rebounds and around six, six or seven assists. So that's still very valuable, completely different than Harrison Barnes, who I think um, played above expectation last year. And right now you're getting him at a depressed value because of the hype around Keegan Murray, but he's still starting. Harrison Barnes is still going to be a fixture of the Sacramento offense. He's probably going to be the third, um, third option in this offense and he can provide the efficiency that you're looking for that you may not get out of Ben Simmons. The difference is Ben gives you more of the defensive metrics, whereas Harrison Barnes um, gives you some threes. He's a pretty steady, consistent player. He's not going to miss a lot of games. Um, he's he's going to provide the floor for you, but I think Ben gives you the upside. Interesting. Now, because I think everyone knows what I would do in this situation, just quickly. So... Yeah, everyone knows what I think of Harrison Barnes, apart from me having a great sound drop to play for his name. I just think he's boring as shit. And yeah. the the worst the worst shot blocking power forward that exists in the NBA. Like Larry Markinen's a better shot blocking forward in the NBA, and that's saying something. Like he just doesn't block any shots whatsoever. And while I agree with you that he is still gonna start, that's pretty clear. He had probably a career close not close well, yeah, close enough to career best last yeah. season. Maybe his Dallas seasons were a little bit better. But he probably does start the season as the third option. I'm not sure he ends it as that. And I, I do think Keegan will at least cut in. And my part of my issue with Barnes is, is that and you, you have Barnes a little bit higher than Simmons, but you, you're right. There's a difference there. Like, what are you doing with your team? Is it are you safety? Are you looking for floor? Or are you looking for upside? Um, but my issue with Barnes is that if, yeah, last season he was playing next to yeah, Trey Lyles for chunks of the season or Chemezi Metu or um, yeah, Marvin Bagley was in there at times, like guys who were bad. And he was able to get some of those extra shots, whereas Murray offers something a little bit different in that mix. Plus also you're adding in someone who takes shots like Malik Monk or Kevin Herter into that lineup also that when Barnes's value is pretty concentrated on being in that number three or number two option. And let's be fair, like he played last season as the number two because Sabonis wasn't there all season as well. So he's going to be taking that step back. I take Simmons every single time here. I don't even care about the floor or or the safety of Harrison Barnes. I would take Simmons without any hesitation whatsoever. Um, is your 
some of your floor worry of Simmons being assuaged, I guess, by him showing up and playing pretty well in that first preseason game? Yeah, I think so. And, and it's also, this is, this is a very high usage team that, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see how Ben really fits into the chemistry because I think he's going to have those dud games where he doesn't really do much because Kyrie's just going to go nuclear or Durant's going to. Um, but I think Simmons, if he can understand his role as a screen setter, um, a rim runner, and then just playing out in transition, he's going to be phenomenal for this team. I just don't know if Ben mentally is ready to do that. If he's all in or not. And that's like a, that's a basketball question, but that also translates to fantasy because if mental health things come up or there's chemistry issues or some kind of turmoil, I think this guy's going to check out. We've already seen what it looks like when he checks out. So that I just want to make sure that at least I know Harrison Barnes is going to play. Yeah. No, no, that, look, that is the risk with Simmons. But I said this on a show the other day. I said, you talk about, oh, can he uh, deal with these other guys having the ball in his hands? And I go, oh, that's, that's almost perfect for him. Like, you don't yeah, want, it's you, a good problem to have. You don't, you, don't want, you don't want me to shoot? No worries. Like, I will just do literally everything else, and you guys can do the thing that I hate with every fiber of my being, and that's shoot the ball. <laughs> like, let me just do literally everything else, and I don't have to shoot it ever. Cool. Like, let me get 12 points just from dunks or um, dump-offs. Like, that's... that's and yeah, he might average... He might Like, he's going to play center on this team, Simmons, I think, for chunks of, of time, yeah. and that's going to be really interesting to see how that goes. We've got a few more ADP battles to talk about before I do that. I'm going to talk about betonline.net because it is, of course, the number one source for football betting info this season. You can find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis on every game you can find. Dan, who is your NFL team? Philadelphia Eagles. Looking oh, good right they now. They are the undefeated Philadelphia Eagles. And I'm just having a look at BetOnline. They have got the Arizona Cardinals, and they are five-point favorites this week. You feel pretty confident in that? Ooh, five is a weird number. Um, it is typically a weird number. I like, yeah, t- t- typically I like going, I like Cliff Kingsbury as an underdog, not as a favorite. So five points, I lean the Cardinals here, to be Ooh. honest. I-, I think it's a trap line and the Eagles have been playing this really good football. You know, they covered uh, the first three games or first three out of the three and one against the spread right now. Um I think that Cliff Kingsbury is going to get up for this one and the Cardinals cover. I don't know if they're going to win, but I think they're going to cover. There you go. Extra, extra bet online advice here from Dan Titus and whatever else you need from bet online. They've got it covered. Live betting, up to the minute scores, and it's the fastest and easiest way to check in on other sports as well, like Major League Baseball, MMA, boxing, and golf. So head to the betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online is where the game starts. All right, we're going to stay in the 80s for this one. And you know, this, I, I think. Dan sort of sits in in a similar mold to the last one. It's like upside and unknown versus safety. Pick 82, Jabari Smith, who's not Jabari Smith Jr. anymore. He's Jabari Smith II. So just if you are looking for him on Yahoo, you guys did change that the designation. Someone said, I was looking for Jabari Smith Jr. He wasn't there, but he's under Jabari Smith II now. Um, versus Brandon Clark, who I was probably in on Clark around this area early on, and I am so far out on him in the top 100 at this point because I, I don't think he's actually going to get to start. To, with Jaron out, and I'm not sure there's really much value here, but it's it's about safety versus unknowns, I guess, for you here, Dan. Yeah, and this is the one that I, I had to I had to remind you real quick because I was like, man, this Brandon Clark take is gonna get is gonna <laughs> age really quickly, poor poorly and horribly. And Santi Aldama, man, this guy yeah. is just ruining my 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 Brandon <laughs> Clark shares right now. He is. Normally, I would have, I mean, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, when I was mock drafting, I was taking Brandon Clark aggressively ninth, 10th round because I was that comfortable that his field goal percentage, his block and steal potential, his per 36 numbers are are exactly what you want to see in a late round big. And now that he doesn't look like he's going to get starters minutes, he's just not as valuable. And if you look at Jabari Smith's first game, man, 21 points, eight rebounds, five triples and 24 minutes of action. He looks like Rashard Lewis to me, um, and I think he's going to be really good. He's going to be one of those stretch four bigs that's going to get sneaky blocks. Um, as long as he can get some 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 semblance of volume, uh, I think there's, there's a very good chance he could be the second or third option. We'll see how Kevin Porter Jr., whether he wants to defer a little bit more, but he looks like a stud. So right now, I would take Jabari Smith Jr., or the second, excuse me. Um, but two, three weeks ago, and when I sent you this rankings, I had Brandon Clark way ahead of him. 
And I was drafting Brandon Clark with the upside, thinking that he was going to get those power forward minutes, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing. You've got to be nimble with your opinions. You can't steadfastly stick to one thing. And I think that's why, like, we could have changed this one around, but I think it's worth having that debate just to highlight yeah. that, that sort of stuff, is that there are, there are plenty of people who would have taken Brandon Clark at 75, like, a few weeks ago. And, yeah, what... Had him as high as 60 in the offseason. Exactly. Like, like <laughs> this is the thing, like, oh, right, who played 27, 28 minutes a night? He'll be a starter while Jaron's out. And then you get like, amazing value then it drops off later on but now he might play like right. two extra minutes it feels like and Aldama was a guy that I was interested in hey let's see what happens maybe he's a last round guy we'll see what he goes but I, he looks amazing in this now Aldama's going to have his value you know lopped off pretty quickly once Jaron eventually does return um and Jabari's unknown like he might he might only average like 13 points a game that, that's possible but 13 and 8 sure. a steal a block one and a half threes he might have bad field goal percentage. I already had Jabari as my number one rookie after Chet went down, about three spots higher than Paolo, but I bumped him up a little bit higher, and I'm pretty interested to see what he can bring because, as I've talked about in this show, like finding guys who can rebound the ball in the later rounds, it's not many of them, unless you want to go into guys with significant deficiencies like JaVale McGee or even um, Brandon Clark's yeah. teammate, Stephen Adams. Like It is hard to find those guys. I'm pretty big on Jabari Smith, and it seems like yeah, you're leaning this way now, but it is worth highlighting that depending on when you're talking about this stuff, Things change and your opinions change based on new information. If you're not willing, Dan, to make those adjustments based on new information, then you're just going to get blown out in, in whatever fantasy sport you're playing, really. Exactly right. You're exactly right. So, yeah, I adjusted my rankings accordingly after seeing Aldama. I thought the Summer League was one sample, was one, you know, small picture of the puzzle. But, you know, seeing him do it in preseason, you know, totally changed my opinion. Completely unrelated, but actually not unrelated. Where would you take Aldama? Is he just strictly a last round guy? Or would you go like into even round 12 just to get to get him on your team? Are you that interested in him? I mean, if if I'm in a competitive league, I think reaching for him in the 12th is valuable because this could be a guy that goes off early in the season, becomes a trade piece. You don't We don't really know when Jaron Jackson Jr. is going to come back. So you might have a sell-high opportunity, you know, mid-season um, that could actually work out really well for you if he really shows out and like, the, plays the way that he's been playing in the preseason. What do you think happens? Again, I just, I'm so interested in the Grizzlies here. What do you think happens when Jaron returns? Like, does he just get out of the rotation? Does Clark get reduced way down? Do they just play Aldama and Clark as the backup four and five and there's no Xavier Tillman in there anymore? Like, is there a risk that Clark is like playing fewer than 20 minutes a night later on? Maybe that's jumping the gun based on a couple of preseason games and it almost definitely is. But yeah. Does that make you even more worried about Brandon Clark? It does. And, you know, I, I actually wasn't looking that far downstream about it, but you're right. And it's it's a question of whether it's going to be Xavier Tillman or maybe they see a reduction. I don't think it's going to be Steven Adams because, no, you know, they so could either. run a small ball, but they just gave him a contract. So he's obviously going to be in the lineup there. So I think it's going to be a battle between Clark and Tillman and whichever wins out. But if Aldama wins this starting gig, um, I think he's going to be the second person behind Jaron Jackson. But, you know, Jaron Jackson is going to definitely be eased in. A little bit of a minutes restriction, likely won't play definitely. on back-to-back -back sets. But, you know, by the time he comes in, you know, we're going to be approaching, you know, post uh, probably near to the all-star break, final two weeks of the push to the playoffs. That's where it's going to really shape out. Um, we'll see how valuable Brandon Clark will be. We're going to stick with the Memphis theme for some reason. I don't know why there's so many Memphis uh, guys we're chatting about here, but we're going a little bit early. Going top 50, pick 45. Desmond Bain and Jarrett Allen are both available. I've sort of been up and down on Bain, and then I saw that first preseason game, and he actually um, had pretty good usage, and I think it was even higher than Dylan Brooks, which is something I've never really thought I'd ever say in my life. But we're, we're at pick 45, and Desmond Bain is on the board, and Jarrett Allen is on the board. Um, what are you doing? This one's tough because I, I've been picking a lot of Baines, but there's also the scenario where I have my shares of Jared Allen because, you know, once you're getting to this 40s pick, um, securing a big man, there's just a drop off after Jared Allen, I think, in, in, in drafts. And securing a big that can get you 10 plus rebounds, uh, multiple blocks, high field goal percentage. And I think he's actually going to play very well with Donovan Mitchell. This could be one of the best scoring outputs he's seen because, you know, even though Donovan Mitchell didn't really like playing with Rudy Gobert, he still gave him the rock and, and gave him easy lobs uh, whenever he got a chance to. So I think he could get a lot of easy buckets for this Cleveland Cavaliers team. Um, the thing about Bain is he gives you the efficiency, and I think he can actually have a better season than he did last year, which was considered his breakout. Um, but in year three, I think this guy's going to absolutely explode. Um, just what he does – and steals defensively, 
um, and what he can do in three points. You know, obviously the the high percentages um, from the field. If he gets more of a usage rate, I mean, this is going to be a slam dunk pick in the in the fourth round here. If you can get Desmond Bain, I think he's going to be one of those. He could turn into like a Devin Booker like player. Um, just not, you know, I don't think he's going to put up 25 points per game, but you know, there's an ascension here. And so I think he can get over to, you know, at least 20 points per game, five rebounds, four assists with those peripheral stats. I think this guy's going to be fantasy gold. It's interesting. Like I, I, in one of my first mock drafts that I did start of September, I took him in round four and then I did it and I immediately regretted it. And I was like, oh, geez, I'm like, I'm not sure. Like he's super valuable. I really like him as a player. I thought he went incredibly low in his draft class. Um, yeah. He was a guy that I was targeting late rounds last season. Obviously, didn't expect that level of blow up from him. Um, and I, look, he he could average twenty five points per game in the right scenario. I don't think Memphis is the right scenario. But if Dylan Brooks again, I don't know how this would happen. But if Dylan Brooks says, "Mate, I'm actually not as good as I think I am. Maybe other people should take the shots." Uh, he he could do it because he should. Him and Jar should get every shot. Really, like realistically, like when you got the opportunity to take a pull up jumper and you're Dylan Brooks and two guys are on you, you should never do it. But he does it all the time. If this new Dylan Brooks, if um, yeah, the guy who took fewer shots than Bain in the preseason is real, then Bain has that value here. But we have detailed already that getting big men, it's really hard. Like they're all injured. Like they're injured. Jaron's out. Rob Williams is out. Miles Turner, we don't know. Like he's had injury risks in the past. Um, Anthony Davis, like who knows? Like there's just so many. And Jarrett Allen, yes, he missed 20 odd games last season, but it's great field goals. It's good rebounds. Um, he might improve efficiency this season as well. I would take Allen here just mainly because if I want some boards and blocks and that, I can get him here, but I, I can't really get them later. Whereas for Bain, for the threes, threes on efficiency is hard to get, but if I want threes, I can try Joe Harris, or I can try Seth Curry, or I can try Tim Hardaway. I can, I can get three threes a game from all of those guys, not at 48% overall, which is what Bain does, and his other peripherals are good. I just, I'm not sure that the value especially if I'm relying on Dylan Brooks, is necessarily going to be what I'm looking for. But I don't hate it in that spot. He does have appeal. I just think the priority for me would be getting a Jared Allen there. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think it's a positional scarcity question. And at that part of the draft, you can get guards that will do Bane-like things, uh, much like in the rounds five, six, seven. If you really want to get that guard, you can double up right there. But finding a big that can do what Jared Allen does, I don't think you're going to find that too far down um, in in the fourth round right there. There's a drop off, and then there's like the then there's the the, the high up and comers like the Jalen Smiths of the world and Isaiah Jackson stuff like that. But yeah, but there's no real guy that's got like that 70 percent field goal upside with also not being a terrible free throw shooter as well. Like Jalen Smith's a good free throw shooter, but he might be 48 percent from the field because he takes a lot of threes. There's not those many of those guys who are the who. Like, Allen's not the best free throw shooter, but he's also not. Seventy percent, you know. Not, I'll, I'll take that. He's not horrendous. It's not. You're not looking at the you know, Mason Plumley's thirty percent or Yucca Pertle's forty percent. You know, and Pertle goes right. in this similar range. Like if you need to protect free throws, you got to grab Allen over it, over a Yucca Pertle because those guys don't. You, Javale McGee might get you ten boards in twenty two minutes, but he'll also shoot fifty percent from the line, and that that's where you got to try and balance and work that out. Now this last one, you did say before we went on air. Oh, I'm not sure about this one anymore, but it's worth talking about because. He is ranked highly on many sites, including your own at, at Yahoo, and that is Tobias Harris. And we're at pick 70. I'm big on Larry Markin, and he's ranked really low over on Yahoo. In fact, his ADP is outside the top 100. I am taking Larry in this range every single time. I'm trying to get his ADP to bump up. Whatever I draft, I'm always pushing Larry in this area. Um, and I, to me, where they're currently ranked and what their ADPs are, I'd switch them. I don't think I'd take Toby until 90s or 100s. And Larry, I'd have in the 70s. I just think that we saw Tobias Harris with Maxi Harden and Bede, and he was sub 20% usage. He was outside the top 100 in that post trade deadline period for the Sixers. And I, I don't really see why he, that would change too much. And I think you've started to come around on that. Yes, I've definitely come around on that. And um, I have a piece coming out very shortly on why Laurie Markinen is severely underrated in, in Yahoo fantasy platforms. He's, it's egregious that he's over 100. Um, I think Tobias Harris, you know, this is again, you know, I was thinking in the beginning of the season, I put Harrison Barnes and Tobias Harris in that same category of, you know, they have a safe, relatively safe floor, decent peripherals. Um, but I think with Tobias Harris now, 
it's clear Maxi should be the third option in this offense. And I'd argue Maxie he should be, be the second option. Yeah, he could be number two. I think he should be the second. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And where does that push Toby to? He's going to be a spot-up shooter. Um, he's not going to have as many touches. His rebounds will be fine. I think he'll still be around seven, eight a game, uh, probably seven. And But without the touches, I, I'm not that interested. It's just boring. It's it's not an upside pick. Whereas you look at Laurie Markkinen, he's getting the most field goal attempts for the Utah Jazz in their first two preseason games. Um, he has no competition for minutes, really, at his position. And they're tanking. So I think that Danny Ainge wants to see what he has with the core of, you know, Colin Sexton and Laurie Markkinen. Those are going to be their foundational pieces. Uh, to build off of and then we'll see how this goes you know but I think the Utah Jazz are definitely going to try to continue to be sellers which will only help for Laurie Markin if he doesn't have to compete for touches with chuckers like you know Jordan Clarkson and uh, Malik Beasley and Mike Conley and so forth so yeah I think Markin and I've really come around on him the most and I, I could think I could thank you for that because uh, we did a couple drafts over the course of the last two weeks and I'm like man Markin is just going you're getting him at the right spot where no one's thinking about it. it's like oh damn that was a good pick and then I end up with someone like Tobias Harris. I'm like, shit, now, now I'm just regretting this. <laughs> my, my next one of those to bump up the ranks is Kelly Olenek, who yeah, started the first two preseason games. Know. And maybe, much like Santiago Dama, maybe later on in the season, his value disappears. But yeah, like he could give you top 80 numbers for the first two, three months of the season. And if you can get him at 140, 120, like as I always say down the show, at the end of the year, like you'll have turned over at least almost a minimum one third of your roster. So you're around eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 picks. Like don't, don't stress too much. Like if you go, well, if I've gone a little early, like if it doesn't work out, you're going to drop so many of these guys anyway. And that's just tends to be what happens. But you're talking about Tobias Harris being boring. He's actually the most boring fan. Well, he was the most boring fantasy player in the NBA. It's like, I'll score average points and average rebounds with average assists and below average steals and below average blocks. And it's marginally below average percentages and average. What do you do that's exciting me? Like nothing. And he's now, a roto guy at this point. He is. You know, like, I'll take the percentages, but in head-to-head, I have no interest in him anymore. And now he's going to lose touches as well over the course of the season because, you know, Tyrese Maxey is now allegedly the greatest shooter of all time. He's going at about 80% in the preseason. By the way, people are going to overreact. I, just, let's just let's move that through to, to Maxey discussion because people are going to overreact. They go, man, look how good he is. And we said he might be the number two guy in usage. I'm, I'm not sure that he, he will be, but... When he scored that 21 points in that first half last game, he had one rebound and two assists. So if he's not getting them to drop at 83%, then the other the problem is is that the peripherals, like does he ever get rebounds, assists, or steals, or blocks? And the answer is generally no. So you're relying upon insane shooting, which he's been doing that now. I don't know how he's this good of a shooter, but you just got to be careful you're not completely overrated because what he's doing is obviously impossible to sustain. Yeah, I think... Um, a less efficient version of him that you can get later rounds is Anthony Simons. I think he's going to put up very similar stat lines, you know, 20 plus points potentially with three rebounds, three assists, four sure. assists, somewhere in that range. And, you know, I think Maxi's upside really is if there's an, any injury, you know, if, he, if there's any injury to Harden, he's going to go to the moon. And I think you'll see him uh, display more counting stats uh, possibilities there. But I do, I've been reaching for Maxi just because, um, you know, I'm a Philly guy and I just love his development and, and where he's gone in the league. And I think he can take that next step up similar to Desmond Bain, but for what they do outside of just scoring and their efficiency, it's not really going to help you too much in category league. So I think people could be overdrafting him. Yeah. The, the risk here that he averages like three rebounds and three assists and 0.8 steals. And you go, okay, that's all good, but that's Jordan Clarkson. The problem is he, the, the value he has and Bain has in that situation is that they do it on really high efficiency numbers, which does right. give them that boost. But you just got to be aware that if that efficiency doesn't sustain at 80%, and obviously he's not going to, that, <clears throat> that the, other, the other stuff isn't quite there at that same level to um, sustain. But Dan, I've kept you too long. And we've done all these things. We've had some pretty good discussions about a bunch of players here. So tell people, A, what you got coming out. You already teased a little bit. That you got something coming out over at Yahoo and where people can find you on social media. Yeah, I'm going to be releasing a little bit more of my sleepers, my my faves, my busts, um, heading into the draft season. We're coming up, man. We're less than two weeks away. Um, but a lot of good content coming from the Yahoo team. And uh, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Dan Titus. I know, super creative. Um, but yeah, find me there and uh, more content coming. Awesome, mate. It was great to have you on the show and to discuss a bunch of players here. Uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll get you back on at some point soon and we'll have another chat. Thanks, Dan. Yes, sir. Good talking to you, Josh. And that 
will do it for me today. It was great having Dan on for the first time. Absolutely ripper bloke. What a, what a good bloke he was. Um, some good discussions there. I hope you enjoyed it. Leave your comments down below on the video and follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. If you're on YouTube, you thumb it up. You leave your comments down below, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.